Okay, dear audience, conference is getting close to end, but we still have one very interesting special session that I warmly welcome you all. This special session is entitled Imagining After Capitalism. So really interesting. And we have as our distinguished speaker, Professor Andy Hines. I'm going to just briefly uh, introduce Andy Hines if you don't know him. So Andy Hines is the current program coordinator at the University of Houston's graduate program in Foresight. Uh, since 2005, he, he has been a lecturer and now a professor of, for the Foresight program. And he has a wide experience from different organizations. So he has been working, for example, for uh, Coach at Jarrett uh, uh, company. He has been uh, a global, in the Global Trends program for the Kellogg company. He has been a futurist and senior idea, ideation leader at uh, Dow Chemical. And then he has been uh, managing director of social, at Social Technologies, now Innovaro, from 2006 and 2010. Uh, Andy is also very experienced with working with different clientele. So, so in his 20 plus years as a futurist, he has served hundreds of clients, including MD Anderson Cancer Center, Nissan, the Lumina Foundation, Clorox, uh, California Office, Office uh, Standards and Training Post, Library of Con Con Congress Cable Labs, and the Hershey Company. And he has also published very widely on Foresight, uh, hundreds of uh, articles, speeches and workshops, including two Emerald Literati Awards for Outstanding Paper at uh, 2003 and 2008. And as, as for a final quote, I, I just read from, the, from uh, your page, you are motivated by a professional hunger to make Foresight practical and useful. And you believe that foresight can help deliver the insight that is so needed in today's organizations and the world. So your goal is to infect as many change agents as possible with this message. So with these words, the floor is yours. Thanks. I may need, I may need to change infection in my marketing message given the pandemic, but so be it, right? Um, I want to infect you with a change agent message. Okay, so the first book I read as a futurist, uh, well, as a would-be futurist, was Limits to Growth. And we heard about that in the opening session uh, of the conference, talking about how it looked 50 to 75 years ahead, suge suggested that there was probably some bad news ahead unless we made some changes. And here we are 50 years later, and we've done very little. So we not, not effective. The second book that I read about the future was called The uh, Image of the Future. And um, it was by Fred, uh, Frederick Pollock. And uh, he was writing, actually, even before the 70s. And he was saying that when you looked at the, the great civilizations of the past or of, of history, that um, they were one of the common char characteristics that they had was that they had a common guiding positive image of their future. They knew where they were going. And when he was writing around the 70s, he was saying one of the things, that one of his observations was we, had, we didn't seem to have that same capacity. We didn't have that same common view of an image of the future. And so here I am in my own journey, you know, 30 or so years later going, you know, uh, what should I do next? And it's like, well, shouldn't we as futurists maybe fill that gap and help develop positive guiding images of the future? If, if we're not going to do it, who else is, right? So that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you about today. Three, uh, it's gonna turn out there'll be three images of the future that uh, I wanna talk to you about. But first of all, how do we get there? Because one what, what, what is one of the things that we've learned as futurists about selling or influencing people to pay attention to the long-term future? It's hard. So, you know, I, I, um, it was mentioned that I worked at Kellogg's and I was in, um, uh, market research, so I learned a lot about how people sell stuff. <laughs> cereal, right? I can sell you some cereal if you need it. Anyway, and they, we talked a lot about the reason to believe. Why should I believe? When you talk about these three positive long-term images of the future, why should I believe you? Okay, so here's why you should believe uh, in a few quick slides. The first, as we set up this view, these images of the long-term future, the first thing we thought about is, all right, time frame. We, love, we have the lovely Three Horizons framework from Sharp and colleagues 
One of the simplest yet most elegant and wonderful tools that I've come across in my whole time as a futurist. In short, first horizon, we're gonna call it neoliberal capitalism. We could argue that, but I think we'd say that's probably a decent definition of the current version of capitalism. Horizon one, the current system. Horizon two is the land of transition. Um, in our, what I will show you today in our work at Houston, we've identified, you could argue, two major Trend, uh, transition pathways. We either get to the third horizon via collapse, oh no, right? Or more, on a, a more gradual approach. And there's a choice involved there. And then finally, the third horizon is the new system. Now, I put some numbers in here just because, and I wouldn't put a whole lot of faith in those. And we've actually done a project with a client where we used the three horizons and didn't put years on them because we, we think it maybe provides a false sense of security. But, you know, all right, close enough, right? We're talking, so we're actually talking about 2040, 2050, right? So this is not next week. Okay, so we've set our time frame. Uh, one of the other handy dandy little tools that we use uh, a lot at Houston is a, a domain map. So we're gonna go through every branch. No, we're not gonna go through every, but we, what we like to do, if you're going to explore, what do you need? A map. So a domain map is just a simple visualization of the categories you're going to study in your dom and domain is just really a fancy word for a topic. So I wanted to show you, there was a lot of, we, we looked at a lot of places, if you'll trust me with that, okay? <clears throat> what, we, what are we looking for? In, hori in horizon scanning, we're looking for signals of change. What's changing in the, you know, if you will, in the topic of after capitalism? We use this little, do we have any Digo users in here? All right, we got one. Anyone else? It's, the, it's one of those free cloud-based tools. It's just a little bit clunky, but it's wonderful for organizing scanning libraries. So if, you're, if, if you like tools, go check out Digo. I don't own stock in them, but we've been using them for several years. We use them on all our projects, and it's a nice handy-dandy little thing. They give you a bookmark bar and an icon, and when you find something of interest, it's easy to collect and tag it. So as you can see, we have, uh, in my after capitalism scanning library, there's 552 signals of change. Again, we're not making this stuff up. When we get to these far out images, they're not just, uh, not, they're based on something. And one something is 552 scan hits, and there could have been more. But you know, okay. And, and what Digo, uh, that's the little tag thing that gives you the idea, but like the, uh, the Digo software enables you to quickly see what's the main signal of change. Okay, in this case, it was China and the circular economy. All right, so we got plenty of those. The second major source or reason to believe in the research that I did for the after capitalism was books. I mean, it's kind of funny, it almost sounds quaint. Well, I've read a lot of books. I almost seem like a professor. Um, anyway. Um, I would say that it probably read double that. Like, so if we had 52 that made the cut, um, and then probably another 100 that we looked at and decided, you know, it doesn't really fit. What, in terms of the fit, what are we looking for in these books? Like, did it talk about that Horizon 3 new system of what the world would look like after capitalism? And as you can see, we were able to find 28 that we felt like did a pretty good job of talking about Horizon 3. Um, then there was another whole set of books which we ended up putting in Horizon 2 that kind of talked a little bit about Horizon 3, but not quite enough, right? Uh, so they gave us some useful insight. So we call those the Horizon 2 transition concepts. And I, I will tell you, by far the most overwhelming book publishing about the topic of capitalism itself is how do we reform it? There are a bajillion, that's a new word, a new term, bajillion books of how do we reform or how do we fix capitalism? I pretty much ignored those. I looked at a few of them just to see, and, and you'll see why in just a second. But there are lots and lots, and there are more books about how to fix capitalism than there are about how to replace it. And I can say, even some of these ones that I ended up including in the replacement category were, mm, you know, a little dicey. So there's not, that, there's not that much written about what's after capitalism, surprisingly. So for each of those books that did make the cut, right, so there's it's still a pretty substantial body of work. For each of those, I developed a template, and I used um, the, the work of Pollock, 
Pollock's Image of the Future. He had some categories for how you think about images. And then my colleague at uh, Houston, Wendy Schultz, uh, actually taught a whole elective on the image of the future for us a couple years ago. And so she's done some amazing thinking about how do you analyze images? So I borrowed from Pollock and Wendy and put it together into this little handy dandy template for, ima for analyzing images of the future. And it was nice to have like a comparative thing where you could look at all the different images in an easy to follow format and see you know, where they agreed and, or didn't agree. So that, you know, the little, for, the, for all the geeks in here who like tools and templates, there you go. The way that uh, at Houston, like after we do, however we do our research, we usually kind of like the, the, the last step is to put together the, what we call the key drivers of change. And I've seen that in several presentations here. So I think you all know the terminology. Um, and it's basically saying, you know, what in this domain, in this case after capitalism, what's making it happen? What are the things that we absolutely have to account for? And I think the second part of the, the drivers is we think of them as like the building blocks or the ingredients for building the scenarios of the images, right? So we can use them not only to understand the research, but to build the stories, right? So they're the foundational elements of the stories. Um, and so let's just, I'm going to go through these un, un, unfairly fast, but I think that's the only way to, to get through everything. But just to give you a flavor of it, right? So we said, you know, what's one of the key drivers of after capitalism? Our values are changing. And in short, if you'll allow this, uh, capitalism is really uh, the, the modern values, which, which are, are kind of, you can be, sum up as, interested in growth, achievement, competition, victories, winners, and losers. It's the perfect value set for capitalism. The alignment is just wonderful. However, we're moving into a world of postmodern values. And I don't know, if, are any of you familiar with the World Values Survey? If you're not, write that down. It's World Values Survey. And uh, it, even though it's based in the US, it's in over 100 countries. And they've been surveying changing values since the 1970s, every five years. So we have this longitudinal data database of values change. What that says is we are moving toward these values called postmodern, which are not in sync with capitalism at all. And if you want to guess, you want to guess the most possible. So postmodern values are about meaning, purpose, community, sustainability, ecology, participation, co-creation. Where does that what, what region of the world does that sound like? I don't know. I'm kind of confused, but yeah, Scandinavia. When, when, the, when the surveys come out, the most po postmodern region of the world is, is Scandinavia. I'm not going to say who's number one because I don't want to start any fights, but you guys are really close. As the most, you know, all right, the most postmodern, right. the big point being there's a shift in values and the values in the economic system are not lining up. Let's leave it at that. We have to, we have to acknowledge that, you know, the, the growth of technology is a, an enormous factor in any future, like it or not. Even if we're not big fans of technology, it is there, it is happening, and we can't ignore it. And it can be a really good thing. Now, I would say the two works that really, in the, uh, I, I think, certainly in the US and perhaps globally that have really pulled this together is you know, Kurzweil's singularity idea, right? That's the one, that's such a big idea that he started his own university on it. And it immediately became bigger than our program. I'm like, what the, you know? Here we are trying to teach discipline study of the future and all we had to do was talk about technology and we could double our enrollment tomorrow. So anyway, so be it, that's what's happened. It's a big popular concept, right? And then uh, Diamandis' abundance thing. So those are kind of this, and they're laying out this argument, which we're gonna see in an image, right? That technology is gonna save us. How about that? Technology is gonna save us. Uh, what else is driving uh, the, the future of after capitalism? Well, maybe, I don't know if it's number one, I put it as number three, but you know, we could argue about the order of these, right? Inequality, um, is anyone, has anyone undertaken the, pic the Piketty adventure in red capital? I wanna give out a door prize. Mark, Mark, Mark who gets the door prize? It's one of those big fat tomes, and it's like you read a thousand pages to say inequality is inevitable. Ah, all right, well, give me that prize back, right? 
it's, it, it's, a sla- it's a slog, but it's pretty, I mean, it, it's, it's one of those it's worth, if you really care about this, it's worth really understanding why, like, all he's basically saying is, capital, the inequality is a structural feature of capitalism. And that's par- why I'm going to go back and say, all these reform efforts, they could improve the situation, but they can't, it can't be fixed. All right, uh, you know, if you want to fight with me later, but I'm saying it's structurally you can't fix it. Okay, that's why it's over. Now, it may take a long time to be over, but it's over. It can't be fixed. Fourth big one, we've heard a lot about automation and labor. I, I, actually, I think the second Machine Age book, uh, it's a little bit old, but it did a really nice job of kind of, without taking a, a position one way or another, laying out the arguments about jobs. Now, what I would say in terms of after capitalism is, you know, the automation is, it's going to happen, right? And, and I forget what presentation talked about it uh, either yesterday or the day before, but saying it's, it's how we, it's the intention that we bring to the automation that matters, right? We can be strategic about it. We need to think about it, but, you know, we're not going to really stop it. We have to be smart about it. Anyway, so that's number four. And it basically says, you know, nobody's safe forever, but some, you know, some jobs are safer than others, but we're moving in that direction. I remember I scared the hell out of my, I never thought my kids paid attention to what I said. And my kids are like, they're picking a major going, is my job going to be automated? Is my major going to be automated, dad? I'm like, no, it's okay. You're all right. Brain science will probably be last, right? Anyway, um, the fifth driver, stagnation, basically says capitalism, one of the other structural features, it needs growth. It has to grow. Just, it's a, all right, to be a little cynical, it's kind of like a giant Ponzi scheme, right? It needs growth, 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 growth. And what, I, what you find in the, in the research is there's all kinds of schemes that we have used to keep growth going. And without getting into all the details, we're running out of schemes. There's, there's almost nowhere left to go. We're, we're getting increasingly bizarre ways to say that we're growing, but we're already really, I think one would argue, we're already in stagnation. A little controversial, but not really. If you dig in, it's like, nah. Okay. Se- number six. So these are the seven drivers of our domain that we're going to project into the future. Really promising. So you know, obviously climate, a huge, we know the huge problem associated with it and the carrying capacity that, you know, kind of reinforces it. But there's also some, pr- some pretty cool stuff, like the net plus trend. I don't know, have you got, has anyone seen one of these? Um, it's, uh, it's an Italian architect, Stefano Boeri, where he's designed a, a dozen of these around the world where they build nature right into the structure. Like, ooh, now that, see, there's some good stuff happening here. Okay, so that's net plus, right? Not only do we not do bad, we do, and not only are we not neutral, we're actually doing Good things. Okay. Now, I'm just, this is going to be probably, I don't know if this is the most offensive slide, but it's up there. The ineffective left. And it's a little bit U.S.-centric, perhaps. We go back to our values. So in the U.S., the left, if you will, is bigger than the right. The right is more organized, more ruthless, and continually beats the left. And here's what, if you, if you allow this, the left is kind of going, that's not fair, you cheated. And the right goes, damn right we did, and we're going to keep on cheating. But that's not right, you can't do that. Well, we're going to keep doing it. And it's like, we go into this, all right, so we say it's like, it's really a giant stalemate. So in the U.S., we have the reds and the blues, if you'll allow this. And what's kind of interesting is the, and remember I mentioned that the modern value is perfect fit with capitalism. In the U.S., at least, they split right down the middle. The old line industrialists are like the true, you know, kind of a little bit leaning back towards the traditional values. And then like the the new tech companies, the Apples and, you know, the Googles and so on are leaning blue. So even in the, even that split, we are so split. We're so split. Okay. And that's probably the, and what we've, all we've said is the, the left, you would, historically, the left has been very visionary, but they've just, they've, all right, they've just blown it. Okay. The key assumption. Now, I I would want to call it a conclusion, but that's not what you're supposed to do as futurist early on in the research, so we'll call it an assumption. But after doing all the research, what we say here is it's disintegrating. But that's what Horizon One does, right? Systems over time degrade. It's a system that is degrading over time. And, you know, here's just some of the reasons why. But my conclusion at the end of this is, like I said, you can't say, it's not, we can't save it. 
So stop the, with the reform capitalism. Let's just leapfrog that and move on. So what do the images look like? Before we get to the images, and they're always building up suspense, we, while in this particular research, I am not detailing the plan to how to get to the images, but you have to say something about the pathway. So let's go back to our three horizons. You see them mapped out here. And I mentioned that we use the version, the version of data's archetypes. So there's four archetypes. The first one is the baseline, and that's the current system. And the current system is the same rules projected forward with no major surprises. At some point, it degrades, right? And then we say there are two pathways, right? The uh, collapse pathway, what's really interesting, uh, we've done some historical research and looked at scenario sets and tried to map, you know, map the scenario sets onto these archetypes, right? On the three horizons. We thought that collapse would be the more common pathway to transformation. Wouldn't you think that? Like we have to have a crisis before we really change? That's what we thought. So far, the overwhelming historical, uh, overwhelming is a strong word, the preponderance of evidence says it's actually going the new equilibrium, which is basically saying the gradual way. We start to change, we pull back. We start to change, we pull back. But all the time that we're changing and pulling back, we're going forward ever so slightly. And at some point, and it usually takes a long time, we get to the Horizon 3 new system. Okay. And it seemed like, now we, we can't, I'll just say this, this is, I think the Three Horizons people, or some of them have said, this is, we're, we're, we might be looking at a 30 year process here. All right? Okay. All right, so now hold that thought. So what we did in Houston is we modified our archetype technique. Um, we were using a different version of it. And we basically said, what we're gonna do now is same thing about the baseline the gradual, the collapse, and then we're gonna to try to identify at least two, two variations of what the transformation new system could look like. So let me show you what we did for after capitalism. So here's neoliberal capitalism, the current system. And then we came up with a whole bunch of gradual, uh, uh, sorry, the, I hate these buildy things. I don't even know what order I did. Okay, so the collapse versions of the future, we called overshoot, that's the environmental collapse. Class war is gonna be kind of the, uh, the social, social political conflict version of collapse. And then the tech one was called rogue AI. So I know uh, in, the, uh, in Circa's Millennium session, uh, uh, mm, session yesterday, Jerry Glenn came and talked about AI. And it's, there, you know, ro we gotta look at the possibility of AI going bad, right? So that's, that, those, are, those give us some ideas of how, what, what might the collapse look like. Really brief, kind of brief sketches, because I really wanted to focus on the Horizon 3 stuff, but anyway. And then you can see the other, um, the, the, the gradual ones. New sources of value says, all capitalism does is instead of focusing on services, we move to data. Instead of data, we move to experiences. Like, there's just a new focus, but it's still capitalism. The, col um, the collaborative sharing platforms are things like the, uh, like Uber. I mean, if you'll allow that, right? that you know, there is something new about Uber, and it's kind of a, but then no, it really ends up being just like, kind of like the old, so it's kind of in between the new and the old. And then there were a bunch of, this is maybe more controversial for this conference, the environmentally driven. What I found was a lot of the um, ideas that talked about you know, sustainability as the, a vision for the, the long-term future, it's, it seemed like a lot of them were really about how do we use sustainability to uh, help capitalism function better, or, or function within the capitalist framework? They weren't really changing. You know, and one might argue it's kind of a smart approach. It says, like, look, this is the system we have. How do we modify our sustainability aims to function within this capitalist framework? Can't argue with it, but it, it wasn't new stuff, right? It was still kind of used in the old language, okay. So those were the gradual versions, and then, as you can see, the three, but we'll, we're gonna talk about those in just a second, right? So we have these three, the three images. After doing all this work, we came up with three. So circular commons. So as you're probably guessing, the circular commons has the most appeal to the environmentally driven folks. They're gonna go, ooh, we like that one. The, the non-workers paradise is, is really, it's really centered around the post-work future. 
Um, and it's very socially and politically driven. And we say uh, that will appeal to, to those folks, right? Primary appeal there. And then, of course, the tech-led abundance appealing to the tech people. Now, I think, I, I shouldn't, I'm going to just give you a hint. I think at the end, you're going to go, wait a second, don't we need all of these? Maybe. But in terms of recruiting people to a vision, we said, let's throw, let's, let's, let's put it out there that we, can, we, can, we, we have visions that might appeal to different constituencies and let them kind of just sort it out. Let them pick. So I don't know, maybe none of these will work, right? But this is, that was the initial idea. Maybe at some point we need to synthesize them, but for now, the idea will be throw them out there and let's <laughs> let the dogs at them, right? Okay, so first vision, circular commons. Now here's, here's where it's a little controversial. I, I, I initially called it sustainable commons. And I'm like, you know, the more I look at it, oh, it, it just, it almost hurts me to say it, but I feel like the, the word sustainable has just been sort of hijacked. And it's, it's too tied into the current capitalist framework that it's kind of gotten watered down and muddy and it's no longer that wonderful galvanizing concept that it was for, what, 40 or 50 years. So I didn't, and then I thought, well, what's, what's if I think about like what's been, what have been the most exciting developments in my own futures work of the last decade, it's been the circular economy stuff. I'm looking at that and to me, is that's a, ooh, this is good. If we could figure this out, not only, not only could we figure it out, it actually, I think the messaging, like how you could position this to folks and say, here's what we need to do, I think people would get it. I'm not going to say it's easy to do, but I think like, you know, this idea that we should use, use less stuff, we should reuse stuff, and as a last resort, recycle. I think people could get that. I think it can work, and it's compelling, and it's new, and it's different. So, I mean, maybe it's mean to sustainability, but whatever, right? And you can see, I even, because I changed my mind <laughs> at some point, I actually had the old image of sustainable in there, but it's now circular, right? Okay, and so the, and the little chart on the right, um, there's like 13 concepts that were around the sustainability. So it, of the three, it was the most popular. There was the most written about, the most interest, the most, I think this has the biggest constituency. And obviously, right here in, in this planetary health and well-being, I think we'd all probably agree with that, right? Um, okay, um, you can see the purpose here, right? It's about stewardship, right? And then in terms of the, it, the individual pieces, um, I don't really have time to go through them all, so I'll just mention a couple that I think are you know, near and dear. Um, probably the hardest one, the commons approach to resource management, oh goodness. We heard a session, uh, my colleague Mina talked about ownership in the future. Can you imagine saying, oh, we're, not, we're gonna manage resources collectively now. We're not gonna do them privately anymore. Oh my, right, that is going to be a difficult. But there are examples of commons-based approaches out there. They're just on really, really small scales. And it's what we used to do pre-capitalism or even pre-agriculture, right? So historically, we have managed resources in common but you know, in people's heads, the idea of private property and capitalism, now the joke is that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism, right? It's like, it's so ingrained that, okay. So I think that's a tough one, but there are some examples in there and that's part of what's in the, the details of the image. How would you make this work? Degrowth, ooh, there's another one. So started out saying, well, maybe we could have sustainable growth. And they're like, well, maybe steady state, that's, that, that might appeal to people. And then at the other end is degrowth. And by the end of the research, I'm like, nah, we, I, th I think, now this is opinion, I think it's, it's degrowth time. We can't muck around anymore, it's too late. <laughs> it's too late for steady state. I don't know if that sounds like a little jingle, right? Because you would think, well, that's, that will be more appealing, right? Well, steady state, right? <sighs> it's hard to see how it works, right? I think we're, anyway. That, that would be a point of, I think, interesting conversation, but I came out in the nature of, all right. And then maybe uh, reintegrating with nature, well, I don't know if there's been a stronger theme in these two, or th two and a half days than that. Maybe the only other thing I'll mention is the gift economy. There's all kinds of different ideas for this. And it's basically saying like, you do what you do, what you do without expectation of re reward and trust that when it's your turn, people will come back for you. So remember I said in the beginning, value shifts? 
I mean, that really is a big shift, right? To trust that. I think we can do it. There are examples of it, but you know, to really get the whole, the whole planet on board with that, ooh wee, <laughs> we got some work to do there. But there are some really nice concepts for how that could work. All right, that's circular commons. The second one, uh, almost as, not quite as many concepts, and you can see I, I'm debating about whether to keep the, the, the Marxian reference in there, because I think that my, my own view is socialism and communism, are, we should avoid those like the plague, because they will absolutely kill us right off, the, at least in the US and some other places, right? If you say your proposal is socialist, oh, fair, and I don't think it's fair, but I think it's the reality, right, that those concepts are just tainted. So we, we, you know, anyway, so that's why I, I, I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of torn between that. But I, I wanted to get the idea of post-work future as, as kind of the embodiment of the second concept. And, you know, I would say, ladies and gentlemen, we're already on the road, right? And the great resignation has made my, argu you know, it makes the argument a little easier, right? I, it's happening over here too, right? Nobody wants to work anymore. Everyone just quits and, yeah, you know. That's the way it's going. What, there, what I would say, the research shows there has been a long-term trend towards work being less important in our lives, being less important in society's daily life. And, but it's been slow and subtle. And what happens in a disruptive situation such as a pandemic is some, sometimes trends that were just kind of percolating along get a turbo boost. And I think the pandemic has turbo boosted, like, what the hell are we working for anyway? Why am I, you know, I'm gonna guess most of you people are like us, right? You're, you're working these ungodly hours and you know, you, okay. And they say, what for? And more people are going, what for? Okay, so um, of course, part of this is the, all about the, in, you know, uh, if we were distributing resources fairly, we probably wouldn't be too worried about this, but that's, that's the big problem, right? We use jobs as the primary mechanism to decide what you get, um, and obviously that has led to this enormous inequality that we said in the beginning, structurally we can't fix it. So some of the ideas here, I love this one about, we've actually become an economy, like the society, the society exists to make the economy better, shouldn't it be the other way around? The economy should serve to make the society better. And that little brain flip, I think makes a whole lot of sense. Like, let's put the economy in, it's not the end, it's, it's the means, it's not the end. Okay. Um, the laziness lie. If people don't work, they will you know, drink and beat each other up. I mean, that's the laziness lie. Like, we won't know what to do with our time. Uh, I think we do. I'll, I'll, I'll try. Can I go first? <laughs> Give me my salary, and I don't have to work. And I think I'll, I'll, you know, use my time fairly productively. Will some people be lazy? Yes. And the reason I say this is because it is a big, you know, in the literature, it is a big counter argument to post work that people won't, won't be able to handle it. I say baloney; they'll be able to handle it. What else? UBI, I know, I'm not sure universal, universal basic income is the right system, but it's a clue, right? It's telling us we're, th if you had mentioned UBI five years ago, for sure 10 years ago, you've been laughed out of the room. Because I've been doing it for 30 years and I've been laughed out of a lot of rooms, right? Every time I bring it up, people are like, oh, look at the, here's the futurist again. But anyway, so now it's, it's in polite conversation. We can talk about UBI and not be laughed out of the room, okay. So the third image, tech-led abundance, basically says technology is going to fix us. Now you can see I have a little skepticism in my voice, but it could happen. It could happen. I, I think one of the one of the things that worries me a little bit about the uh, the technology one is, you know, it assumes that we will make good choices with the technology, and I'm not sure we should buy that assumption, right? We could, but what if we don't? And I think. You see here that I say at the bottom, incentivizing entrepreneurs. What I sense from this, the images associated with tech-led abundance is, it's the most, it's the, of the three images, it's the one that's the most like capitalism. We need to provide incentives so entrepreneurs will create stuff because they won't do it otherwise. Again, I'm not sure I believe that, but that's what the, this image says, okay? The other thing I did want to point out, scarcity to abundance, I think, I mean, I would argue that we're, obviously we have a, a ginormous distribution problem, but we're already in abundance. We just don't know how to distribute it, right? 
I mean, we, we have enough for everybody in the whole planet if we distributed it fairly. So we're already in an abundance world. We just haven't figured it out yet. And, and if these guys are, if they're right, and they're mostly guys, but not all guys, but there are a lot of guys, right? If, the, if this is correct, yeah, we're going to have a lot more abundance. And it's just a distribution problem. All right, I'm conscious here of my time. So there's two slides here to wrap it up, and then we'll do a little bit of questions. So maybe you have one, in, uh, one image in there you like. Maybe it's a combination of all the three, but where should we put our efforts? We're all in here trying to save the planet. We're all well-intentioned. We're trying to do our, do our thing. Where should we focus? One of my favorite slides of all time from, from the world of systems, and here we go back to Limits to Growth. Donella Meadows, one of the... Um, co-authors of the limits, initial limits to growth study was asked to say, well, how would you, where, where would you recommend intervening in a system? And she just sort of put together this essay. And if you'll allow the three categorizations to save time, she says, well, one thing you do is you, you, you muck with the numbers. Change growth rates, change tax rates, change incentives. She was easy to do. We spend most of our time there, but it doesn't really move the needle. It feels good, but it doesn't really do much. Now, if you start to change the rules of the system and the structure of the system, ooh, no, things are starting to happen. But that's hard to do, right? So, but more effective, harder to do. So then, you, all right, as you say, you get down to the bottom. What's the most effective way to change the system is you change the mindset of the people who are involved in the system. You do that, the rest is, the rest is child's play. Once you get the mindset changed, the rest is easy. But of course, it's the hardest thing to do. Right. You know, we've, we've all talked, I've heard culture change, paradigm change all throughout this conference. We all agree it's really hard to do. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but it, we recognize that it's hard to do. Okay. And really, you know, you'd want, all th you'd want to be doing all three things, right? Working on paradigm change, trying to change the rules, and then, you know, playing with the numbers. <laughs> I, I should be more, I should be nicer to the metrics, but I'm not. Okay. Um, and then last, so this is the last. So if, if we do believe, uh, if you uh, believe the assumption that the uh, mindset shift is the most important, you know, it's the most effective way to change a system, what are some of the, what, what should we, where should we aim that, so to speak, right? So the values. Now, if you'll allow the, uh, the, the, the really quick um, generalization here, what the World Values Survey and some researchers and analysts, including myself, say is that the, historically the values sets that we've embraced as, a, as people have basically said there's one right way to do things. And if only everybody else embraced my values, the world would be great. Right? Traditional values say we should all have traditional. Modern says we should all have modern. Now, just to be fair, postmoderns are just as guilty and sometimes even guiltier. We call it the mean green meme in, you know, out in California where everybody's there. They, not everybody. Now, you know, I'm overgeneralizing. So just turn off the tape here. It's terrible stuff, right? But is it, there is this tendency like the superiority that, you know, you should do it. I know better than you. And it doesn't help. It doesn't help, right? It gets, it, and remember I said divide. Okay. We got divides. Anyway. There is a fourth type, the data shows, really faint, three to 5% of the global population called integral. And the integral system is the first one that these, the holders of integral values say, there isn't a right way. It depends on the situation. Oh, oh, that's what we need, folks, right? We don't need the right way. We need a way that embraces all the different ways. Now, this is tiny. It's 3%, but it grows. It grows. So slow. So, yeah, you know, that's why we got 20 years. Maybe in 20 years, it's big enough. Okay. So the, uh, the shift from economy to, uh, you've seen some of these other masters of nature to partner with nature. Oh, boy, that's been a big theme in this conference. Um, growth to degrowth, full employment to unemployment, private. Pro so a lot of the themes that we've been talking about, they're really mindset shifts. Now, there are tangible things to do once the mindset has shifted. shifted. Like, how do we develop a common system? <laughs> we might believe it's a good idea. Okay. So I guess, you know, to kind of sum up the, the major argument of the whole thing is saying that, the, you know, the current neoliberal capitalist system is disintegrating. And if you want to be charitable, it did its job, and now it's time to move on, right? It, it, it got us to this state. Thank you for that. What, what, do, what might be some viable long-term futures that we would actually want to work towards? 
Is it circular commons? Is it the non-workers paradise? Is it tech-led abundance? And we're hoping that there's some ideas out there that will gal galvanize enough, enough people to undertake some of this work to shift our mindsets in that direction. So if we're lucky, that will happen. And if we're not, um, I'm gonna stop on that. We're not gonna talk about that. All right, so we got a little bit of time for questions, so let's fire away. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Andy. It, it was really great stuff, I, I must say, and, and, and really good way to sort of close this conference, also living with big thoughts and, yeah. and this kind of big design. Please, if you have any questions, I bet you have a couple of, so let's take Marku first and then Nick. Ah, yeah, there they got. I thought you were throwing that. <laughs> All right, um, thanks. Thanks very much, Andy. Um, the real challenge that I always find in thinking about what comes after, after the current one is that, how do we imagine that to really work? What is the way, this is now the way that the current system works, you know? We go and study, we have a work, and after that we retire, we get our pensions, we somehow try to a little bit to take care of the others who are kind of left <laughs> somewhere in the marginals. But I like to see, and I don't know how far you go with this, I hope you go far enough to, to really to imagine how does that life after the current society looks like? What is the life after capitalism? What is our human perspective on how do we actually run our individual and collective lives then? So the idea, yeah, the excellent, I agree completely. And the idea is like, all right, let's throw the images out there. And I think we should all do that, right? And see what sticks. And when we find something that sticks, then, you know, well, all right, let me back up. We need to put enough of the pathway in the images that you can say, okay, I can kind of see that. And that's what I'm trying to do in the book. Like, okay, I, I don't have all the details, but I, I, I follow what you're saying and I could at least imagine it. It's, and, and then see which one sticks. And then let's dig in and start, because it, it is going to be a ton of work to do all this stuff. So, uh, but I, I just don't see the point of doing detailed plans for images that maybe nobody even cares about. So that's, it's, it's just basically a sequence question. What comes first? The image comes first, the, the plan second, I think. Yeah, thank you. And Nick then. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm next. Yeah. Uh, um, thank you for your talk, it's very interesting. Um, one question that I have is about uh, Telios, about your goals, about your purpose of using the future. And uh, what I heard in your presentation is that you have a goal of setting visions that will sell, that people want to pick that they will want to create. And I'm wondering, for, uh, I guess from my perspective, as a capabilities-oriented uh, futurist, as a person who's promoting futures literacy, is what value is in that? Um, so uh, is it more important to say, here's the pattern we could build, or is it more important to uh, give people some facility to uh, uh, understand that their future is kind of present in how they're acting now? Uh, so that they will innovate uh, in, in more uh, interesting and dynamic ways. Um, <clears throat> so that's my question. I, I don't know if it made sense, but hopefully. Yes, it does. All right, so here's my simple answer to that. So I know the anticipation argument, and I would say there's, you know, there's different pathways to the future. The anticipation, that pathway is a good, valid, useful one, and I say go. This is not the anticipation pathway, it's a different one. And who knows who's right? Now, I, don't, I don't know that my pathway is any better than that, that pathway. So to me, the more options we have for thinking about where we want to go, the better. Um, I have to follow up. So uh, you are anticipating when you made the visions. You're using the future when you make the I visions. Understand. And so your, your work will be stronger if you're more reflexive about that and you bring that forward. Like, I am making these visions because I want people to use them to rethink about how we're doing this, or however you want to define it, but you're using the future when you do foresight. That's the thing. I understand. Yeah. All right. That's cool. This is delivered. I understand the, the, uh, the argument, and you can either buy it or not. I don't buy it, but that's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. That was absolutely fascinating. I wonder whether, you know, in terms of young people, you, there's a, I mean, the average age here is a little 
older. But you know, when I look at young people, I see the way they're reacted to climate change. I see what they're doing now in terms of gun control and going on strike at schools. And you know, people want change. Young people want change, and they're doing a lot of the things that you just described. And I wonder whether it's a bit like the '60s revolution. You know, where our parents didn't understand us when we were children. Um, you know, I can remember screaming in front of the TV, television when I was seven, you know, my parents, and the Beatles were there, and they just didn't understand that behaviour. And I wonder whether what we're seeing now is with young people that, and we do have some hope, because they, um, well, I guess not everyone, but a lot of kids are really showing, demonstrating uh, in the streets to say that they want change. It, you know, it, it may turn out that we don't need images, right? I mean, this, this is, like obviously, this is the, the whole argument here was the, the, the image-driven argument. But, you know, maybe that catalytic action that's happening, maybe that leads somewhere, and maybe it doesn't need a destination, so to speak, from the beginning. But if it does, let's, you know, that, that's what this idea is. If, if, if an image is useful, here's what that might look like. But we may not need it. But I, th I think so, but... Who knows? Okay. Yep, Sun up next. Thanks, Andy. Uh, great, really interesting stuff. Um, what I was curious about was that you mentioned that there was, in, in the material you went through, that there was a lot of this circular economy stuff, and you included that in the circular commons idea. Um, but often what I have felt, at least in the stuff, what I have, you know, I have not researched that, but just what I have been reading, it has seemed that the, often the circular economy has actually been used as just like an, a, like a, transform, a small transformation of the current capitalist system, mm. rather than actually changing anything fundamentally. So, so how did you see this in a different way, or, or how did you see that? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's true of anything, right? I, I, was, I was accusing sustainability of the very same thing, and um, not accusing sustainability, you know, that's just what happens, right? So if you think, one of the things we've learned when we've looked at the historical scenario sets and said, how have they evolved into the future? One of the things we find is that whatever the current system is, it's really smart and clever at saving itself. New ideas come out, it's like they look at them, you know, just think of it, and they, they figure out a way to kind of bring it back into the current frame. So it's almost like to really have a new, novel, creative, innovative idea, it's really hard to get out of the current system straitjacket, right? So almost anything that, you know, they'll, they'll, tr you know <laughs> they'll try to bring it back into the fold, so to speak. So, yeah, I mean, even circular is going to get, probably have its struggles, but I still think it has a, a compelling, uh, compelling possibilities. But yeah, I could totally see that, totally see it. Okay, let's take one final question from, <laughs> are you going to read it? There was quite fundamental question in, in the, in oh, in the chat. web. Uh, we have one question in the chat, and uh, where do you see the signs and signals of a circular economy that actually provides an alternative economic paradigm to neoliberalism? Currently, circular economy is understood by policy and promoted by Mar Mark Arthur Foundation as merely closing the loop in production consumption systems, not as a different economic paradigm. The mainstream images of circular economy seems like a patch, then a radical change. A patch to continue the growth discourse. Implicit message behind, if we close the loops, we can continue growth by decoupling it from material throughput. I'd really appreciate insights and signals that actually can put the growth on the agenda of policy and business. That was a long one. This is a that's tough right. one. I no, and I would say that that's why I put circular with commons, because I think that's, to, I think the questioner is exactly right. As presented, the circular, it's a fairly narrow, but okay. So what, it's still a good idea, even though it's, it's, it's purporting to do a certain thing. When you marry that with the ideas of the com, you know, a commons-based approach, then things get really interesting. So to me, I, I don't find that that's a, you know, a, a big problem. You, uh, and, you know, part of what we do as futurists, you know, it's like the, I, the ideas that are out there uh, that we can use, you know, how, how can we expand them, you know, how can we expand them and grow them? So I, I do think we can build on the circular economy principles to build something bigger by kind of integrating in with those, these common, the, the idea of the commons. So that's how I would answer that, yeah. 
Okay, with this fundamental question, I think we can close the session. Yeah, geez, because Andy needs questions. to fly to airport, and, <laughs> and uh, that's 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 about the case. So thank you, Andy, for really refreshing, really really good, uh, you know, mind blower. I, I really like this this uh, session, and let's give a big hand for Andy and for thank all you. the questions. So thank you.